Hello, and welcome to the Chapter 9, Parts 1 and 2 lecture. You should use the information in this lecture to complete the Chapter 9, Parts 1 and 2 guided notes, which of course you should complete before attending class. In this chapter and the next, we're going to discuss two metabolic pathways that are especially important to living cells, photosynthesis and glucose metabolism, which is also known as cellular respiration. Both of these pathways are especially important because they have to do with energy, how cells get their energy and how they use their energy. The first metabolic pathway is known as photosynthesis. I'm sure you've heard of it before. This is the metabolic pathway used by plants and some protists such as algae, in which they take in CO2 from the environment, that's carbon dioxide, and water, and they use it in combination with energy from the sun, that's energy, to build large sugars such as glucose. C6H12O6 is good old glucose. So in this way, they are capturing energy from the environment, from sunlight, and storing it up for later. As a byproduct of this reaction, photosynthesizers make O2, oxygen gas, which is the gas that we breathe. The second metabolic reaction we're going to talk about in this chapter is glucose metabolism, or the breakdown of glucose. In this reaction, energy stored inside molecules such as glucose is going to be released and it's going to be transferred into molecules that are smaller and easier to use, such as ATP. What's the relationship between glucose and ATP? Well, think about it like this. I want you to think of glucose as being like a $100 bill. A $100 bill is a pretty big chunk of currency, and if you take that into a store where everything costs a dime, the shopkeeper is going to be really unhappy with you. It would actually be much easier to spend a dollar in a store where everything costs a dime than a hundred dollar bill. So that's essentially what the cell is doing. It's taking a big molecule that holds a lot of energy and it's making change. It's breaking it down into a molecule that's smaller and easier to break down one at a time as the energy is needed by specific reactions. Let's take a closer look at glucose metabolism. In this reaction, glucose molecules and other similar sugars, are going to be broken down in the presence of oxygen. This is that nice gas that we breathe, and it's going to get broken back down into CO2 and water. And then the energy from the glucose is going to be funneled into this nice little easy to use molecule called ATP. So we're harvesting the energy that was, of it, that was first stored up through photosynthesis. Another interesting thing to notice about these two reactions has to do with how they're related to one another. They're actually sort of symmetrical. Notice this. The reactants of photosynthesis are the same as most of the products of glucose metabolism. And the products of photosynthesis are actually the same as the reactants needed for glucose metabolism. So these two reactions go together. This diagram illustrates really nicely how these two metabolic pathways are related. Let's start over here. Inside a plant cell, you're going to have chloroplasts. And chloroplasts are going to take in CO2 and water, combine it with light energy, and use that energy to combine those CO2s into organic molecules such as glucose. As a byproduct, the chloroplasts are going to release oxygen gas. Now those organic molecules can be stored up for later. For instance, if the product is glucose, it can be stored up as starch for later use. When the cell needs to use that starch and needs to harvest some of that energy, it'll take some of those glucose molecules out and send them, along with that oxygen, to the mitochondrion. Inside the mitochondrion, cellular respiration is going to occur, and in that reaction, the organic molecules are going to get broken down, the energy from them is going to get funneled into ATP, You'll also produce a little heat energy as a byproduct, and then that ATP can be used to perform specific reactions. The byproducts of this are going to be CO2 and water. 
which the chloroplasts can then take in again and repeat this process. They can use it in photosynthesis, make more organic molecules such as glucose and oxygen, funnel that into the mitochondrion, break it down, make more ATP, and so on. So the cycle repeats over and over. Now plants and algae are autotrophic, so they are going to contain both chloroplasts and mitochondrion. But what about us? What about animal cells? Our cells don't have chloroplasts, so what in the world can we do? Well, we perform the bottom half of this. We perform cellular respiration, but we do not perform photosynthesis. So where do we get our raw materials? Where do we get our organic molecules and oxygen? Well, oxygen, of course, we get from the air, and organic molecules, well, we get those by consuming other organisms. We eat plants, and we eat animals, and we take in the sugars we need and break them down to perform all of our reactions and energize our reactions. This slide is just here to remind you a little bit about how energy flows inside living cells. In order to stay alive, maintain homeostasis, and to resist entropy, living cells constantly have to take little monomers, such as amino acids, and build them into big molecules such as proteins. They use these big molecules to maintain themselves. Now these building reactions are anabolic in nature. That means that they require energy. We also know anabolic reactions as endergonic reactions. So where do cells get the energy to do all of this nice building? Well, the energy comes from coupling the anabolic reactions with catabolic reactions. Catabolic reactions release energy. They are exergonic in nature. So for instance, energy taken in through the food, if you're talking about an animal cell, or energy taken in from glucose from photosynthesis, if we're talking about an autotrophic cell like a plant, those big molecules will be broken down the energy will be released through exergonic reactions, and the byproducts will be smaller than the big molecules that you started with. That energy can then be funneled into the anabolic reactions, so cells can build stuff that they need. More catabolic reactions then have to be performed to keep performing these anabolic reactions and over and over again. This chapter is going to focus on the catabolic or exergonic reactions that cells can use to release energy. The first reaction is the simplest, but the least efficient. It's known as fermentation. Fermentation is a partial breakdown of sugars, so it just takes in glucose or other sugars and breaks them down a little bit. One of the nice things about fermentation is that it's anaerobic. That means it does not require oxygen. So organisms that live in oxygen-free environments can often use fermentation to produce the ATP they need. Both eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells can perform fermentation. Another catabolic or exergonic metabolic pathway that's often used by cells is known as aerobic respiration, also sometimes called cellular respiration. Now this metabolic pathway is big and complicated. It's actually made of several reactions that happen in a particular order, and we'll get into all of that. For now, you should know that aerobic respiration is the pathway favored by our cells. So you mainly find it being used by eukaryotic cells. Some prokaryotic cells can do this as well. Aerobic respiration is a complete breakdown of sugars. So it's more complicated than fermentation, but it's also more efficient. You get more energy being harvested out of those sugars than with fermentation. One of the things that's required for this reaction to happen is good old oxygen. That's what the word aerobic means, is that it can only happen in the presence of oxygen. In fact, this is the reason that we breathe oxygen. It's the reason that we die pretty quickly if we stop breathing oxygen. Another big complicated catabolic exergonic metabolic pathway is known as anaerobic respiration. Now like aerobic respiration, this pathway consists of several different steps. It is quite complex and it is very efficient. It is a complete breakdown of sugars. 
Unlike aerobic respiration, however, anaerobic respiration does not require oxygen. So this can be performed by cells that live in oxygen-free environments. For that reason, you mainly find anaerobic respiration being used by prokaryotic cells, things like bacteria. You may have inadvertently experienced anaerobic respiration if you've ever had a sinus infection. You know, sometimes you get a cold and your nose is stuffy and it hurts, and then after the cold kind of goes away, it seems like it comes back and your face is still just stuffed full of snot and feels terrible. Well, what's happening there is that your sinuses inside your skull got clogged up with mucus, and that created an anaerobic environment. In that anaerobic environment, anaerobic respiration can happen. The bacteria took advantage of this oxygen-free environment and started multiplying. And by that multiplication, it puts a lot of pressure on your sinuses, and so it feels terrible. So often you kind of have to wait until the mucus kind of clears out of there before oxygen can get in there and kill off those bacteria. And sometimes antibiotics are helpful in clearing that up as well. But that's anaerobic respiration. Next, we need to discuss how living cells physically transport the energy released by catabolic reactions to the energy required by anabolic reactions. Well, they accomplish this using molecules known as energy carrier molecules. These molecules can include ATP, NADH, and FADH2, among others. So how do these little molecules work? Well, when energy is released by the big catabolic reactions, it will be either be released in the form of energized electrons or phosphate groups. And these little molecules will come along and they will pick up those energized electrons or phosphates. They will either be reduced or phosphorylated, depending on the type of reaction you're talking about, or the type of molecule. Now in this reduced or phosphorylated form, they are energized. They have the most energy in this state. So now what these molecules can do is travel over to the big anabolic reactions that require energy. At this point, they will be oxidized or dephosphorylated. They will release those energized electrons or phosphate groups into those reactions, and those particles carry energy with them. So that energizes the anabolic reactions. Now these little molecules are oxidized or dephosphorylated, so they've been depleted of their energy. So now what they have to do is go back to the catabolic reactions, get energized again, so that they can travel back to the anabolic reactions, drop off their energy, become oxidized, and start the cycle over again. So these little energy carrier molecules, by going through these cycles of breakdown and recycling, physically connect the catabolic reactions that are exergonic to the anabolic reactions that are endergonic. If you look closely at the cycle, what you'll see is that what we have going on here really are two sets of coupled reactions working together. When the catabolic reactions release energized electrons, when they release their energy, that's exergonic. 
But when these little energy carriers grab those electrons, that's endergonic. So that's a coupled reaction. Then when the little energy carriers release their energized electrons or phosphates, that's catabolic or exergonic. And of course that powers the big endergonic anabolic reactions. So again, what we have here are two sets of coupled reactions working together. Let's talk about ATP in a little more detail. ATP is by far the most important energy molecule inside your, your cells. It's like the energy money or the energy currency of your cells. Anytime your cells want to perform a little chemical reaction that requires a little energy, it will break down an ATP. And then that ADP has to be recycled. This is accomplished through a series of phosphorylations and dephosphorylations. So let's start up here with ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It has three phosphate groups and that is where the energy is stored. Now if your cell wants to perform a chemical reaction, it's going to need to harvest some energy out of this ATP. It's going to be, do that by dephosphorylating it, by removing a phosphate group. So the leftovers there are ADP, or adenosine diphosphate, and a lone sad little phosphate group. That releases energy that can do work. Now we need to recycle this ADP back into ATP. So what can we do? Well, we're going to put that little phosphate together with the ADP, forming ATP again, capturing that energy inside ATP. Glucose metabolism, or cellular respiration, which we're going to get into in more detail in a minute, is largely about this part of the cycle, about taking ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and phosphorylating it. Where does the energy come from for that? Well, that's the breakdown of glucose. Energy is funneled out of glucose and used to build as much ATP as possible. There are a couple of different ways to phosphorylate ADP into ATP. In other words, there's a couple of different ways to make ATP. The first method is slower but simpler, and it's known as substrate level phosphorylation. Now think about this. Where have you heard that word substrate again? Well, substrate, of course, those are molecules that fit into enzymes. They are the molecules that enzymes work on. So in substrate level phosphorylation, what happens is that an enzyme comes along, it picks up an ADP and some other molecule with a little phosphate on it, and it transfers that phosphate onto the ADP to make ATP. The enzyme will also end up making a little product that has been dephosphorylated because it had a phosphate group removed from it. Substrate level phosphorylation, again, is slow. Each enzyme can only make one ATP at a time, but it's a pretty simple, straightforward method. Another way to make ATP that is more complicated but also more efficient goes by several names. It's known as electron transport phosphorylation. It's also known as oxidative phosphorylation, which is the name I tend to use, or sometimes you'll hear it referred to as chemiosmosis. Let's take a look at this method. This method uses a machine called ATP synthase. And this giant enzyme complex is built into the membrane of a mitochondrion. This machine has moving parts that rotate and rock back and forth, so it's much more complicated than the substrate level phosphorylation we just saw. But the advantage of using this method is that it's really fast. This little guy can take many ADPs and phosphorylate them in rapid succession. So this complex method is a way of making a lot of ATP at once. Another category of energy carrier molecules are known as electron carriers. These include NADH and FADH2. Now, unlike ATP, which is dephosphorylated and phosphorylated to release and gain energy, these guys work by being oxidized and reduced. They work with electrons specifically. So let's look at an example. 
Here we have NAD+. You can tell that NAD+, has been oxidized because it has that plus sign. The plus sign indicates that it's lost an electron. Now it's going to want to get that electron back. So how can it do it? Well, to do this, it needs to interact with two hydrogen atoms. From one of the hydrogen atoms, it's going to steal an electron. Poor little hydrogen gets picked on all the time. It can then bind with the other hydrogen atom, forming NADH. This is the reduced form. Now, the reduced form has more energy in it than the oxidized form. So that reduced form can travel somewhere else in the cell, get broken down again, and then those il uh, energized electrons can be used in other reactions. They carry the energy necessary for that reaction to do its work. So this cycle repeats over and over again. Another way to think of these electron carriers is either as a taxi cab or as a dump truck. I like the dump truck, but let's look at the taxi cab. Here we have a taxi cab that is empty. This is the oxidized form NAD+. When it's loaded with passengers, it's full of energy. It's the reduced form. It can then travel somewhere else in the cell and dump its passengers out, becoming oxidized again. I like to think of these as dump trucks because I like to picture little dump trucks traveling to maybe a coal mine, getting filled up with energy from the coal mine, and then traveling somewhere else in the cell, becoming oxidized and dumping out their coal to energize other reactions. But either analogy works. This chart shows the oxidized and reduced forms of our electron carriers. The oxidized forms have less energy in them than the reduced forms. The reduced forms have more energy. That's the energized form. So for instance, NAD+, after it interacts with two electrons and its two hydrogens, it will form NADH and a hydrogen ion. This is the form that holds the most energy. It can then travel somewhere else in the cell and get oxidized back into NADH. It will release those two little electrons with their energy into another reaction to do some work. Another energy carrier you will see is FAD, FADH2. The oxidized form that's empty is FAD. It will also interact with uh, electrons and hydrogens to form the reduced form, the energized form, which is FADH2. This energy carrier we will see in photosynthesis, so just kind of keep it in mind for now, but we'll see it in action in Chapter 10. Now that we have the preliminary information out of the way, we can focus on all those nice reactions that make up the metabolic pathway of glucose breakdown, also known as glucose metabolism. Now in this part of the lecture, we're going to focus on the reactions that happen in the cytoplasm, such as glycolysis and another one called fermentation. In part three of the lecture, we're actually going to go inside the mitochondrion and see the other reactions that occur. That part is actually known as cellular respiration. Let's get started. This particular metabolic pathway is known as glucose metabolism or glucose breakdown. So that begs the question, why glucose? Sure, glucose has a lot of energy in it, but can't we use other molecules for energy too, like fats and proteins? Well, we can break down those other molecules for energy, but it might surprise you to learn that the glucose breakdown pathway is actually the simplest. So it's the kind of go-to energy harvesting reaction that your cells use. Most of your cells prefer to use glucose breakdown um, long before it will start to break down proteins and fats. Glucose has a lot of energy in it. So again, I want you to think about glucose as being like a hundred dollar bill. It's big energy currency. And what we're going to try to do through these reactions is break it down and harvest the energy out through a series of small steps, getting a little energy each time, and we're going to funnel all of that energy into making ATP. So essentially what we're going to do is take a $100 bill and break it down into $1 bills that are easy to spend. Just to remind you, glucose is C6, H12, if I can write it, O6. All right, let's get started. 
Here is the overall process for our metabolic pathway, our overall process for making ATP. First, we're going to break down glucose. So again, we're going to break it down through a series of steps and suck a little bit of energy out of it several times. I represent that with a fire, okay? Burning glucose releases its energy. Next, that energy is going to be funneled into our dump trucks, our NADH molecules and our FADH2s. They're going to get loaded with energy and they're going to carry it somewhere else in the cell. Where are they going to carry it? Well, they're actually going to carry their energy to this giant machine that we call the ETC, or the electron transport chain. They are going to dump their energy into the electron transport chain, energizing this machine, and that machine is going to make our ATP. This is the big profit step of the metabolic pathway. These are our four major sets of reactions that make up glucose breakdown. In this part of the lecture, we're going to discuss glycolysis and fermentation, and we'll discuss these other three in part three of the lecture. Now these reactions are probably going to seem kind of complicated to you. So keep in mind what you need to know for each one. For each of the reactions we talk about, you need to know where it happens inside the cell, you need to know the major events that happen. You need to know what we start with, what the ingredients are, and what we end up with at the end of each reaction. And you need to know kind of how these reactions link to one another. You also need to keep careful track of the number of ATPs, NADHs, and FADH2s that we fill up at each step. Our first major reaction in glucose breakdown is glycolysis. Now that word glycolysis literally means sugar, glyco, lysis, breaking, sugar breaking. So what we're trying to do is take glucose and snap it in half and break it into two smaller molecules known as pyruvates. This occurs through a series of eight or 10 steps, each of which is catalyzed by a different reaction and a different enzyme. So this process can get quite complicated, but we're going to keep it pretty simple. Where does this reaction occur? Well, it occurs in the cytosol. So if this is the cell, and here's the mitochondrion, we're actually over here. We're out here in the fluid of the cell. That's where the enzymes that perform glycolysis exist. We're going to split glycolysis down into two phases. The first phase is known as the glucose activation phase. This phase exists because all reactions need a little activation energy to get started. So in this phase, what we're actually going to do is take glucose and add a little energy to it. We're going to add a couple phosphates to it. Now where do the phosphates come from? Well, they come from two ATPs. So in this step, two ATPs are actually going to be broken down and stripped of their phosphates dephosphorylated, and glucose is going to be phosphorylated. It's going to be energized. That's going to prepare it for the next step. The second phase of glycolysis is known as the energy harvesting phase. So obviously we're going to get some energy back out of glucose at this point. Now the product of our last step was fructose biphosphate, that glucose that was rearranged and had phosphate groups added to it from two ATPs. In this phase, the fructose biphosphate is essentially going to get snapped in half. Notice that the fructose biphosphate has six carbons in its backbone, and the product, pyruvate, only has three. So this six carbon chain gets snapped in half. Now anytime you break a big molecule like that, you're going to release energy. So energized electrons are going to be released. Those are going to get numbed right up by this NAD+. It will be reduced into NADH. So it has captured a little energy from that breakdown. Energy is also going to be released that can be used to phosphorylate four ADPs into four ATPs. So we actually made a little ATP at this step, which is good because that's the goal overall.
Let's talk about the energy yielded by glycolysis. And by energy yielded, I mean how much ATP did we actually make? So the second phase of glycolysis makes four ATPs, which is great. But remember that the first phase used two ATPs. So gross, we have four ATPs, but profit-wise, we really only have two ATPs. So through this process, we're only ahead by two ATPs. As this mountain biker heads up the trail, the breakfast he ate this morning is being burned to power his bike ride. His breathing rate increases as his leg muscles demand more oxygen to burn more fuel. Let's zoom down to where this fuel is burned, our cells. Here, the blood vessel on the left delivers fuel and oxygen to a single muscle cell. In cellular respiration, energy in fuel is converted to ATP, shown here as starbursts. Most ATP is made in the cell's mitochondria. ATP powers the work of the cell, such as contraction. Let's take a closer look at how ATP is produced from a molecule of glucose, our fuel. Only the carbon skeleton is shown to keep things simple. The first step is called glycolysis, and it takes place outside the mitochondria. To begin the process, some energy has to be invested. Next, the molecule is split in half. Now, the molecule NAD+, an electron carrier, picks up electrons and hydrogen atoms from the carbon molecule, becoming NADH. Keep track of the electron carriers. They play an important role by transporting electrons to reactions in the mitochondria. In the final steps of glycolysis, some ATP is produced, but not much. For every glucose molecule, only two net ATPs are produced outside the mitochondrion. However, glycolysis has produced pyruvic acid, which still has a lot of energy available. Let's follow this pyruvic acid molecule into a mitochondrion to see where most of the energy is extracted. As the molecule enters the mitochondrion, one carbon is removed, forming carbon dioxide as a byproduct. Electrons are stripped, forming NADH. Coenzyme A attaches to the two-carbon fragment, forming acetyl-CoA. Coenzyme A is removed, and the remaining two-carbon skeleton is attached to an existing four-carbon molecule that serves as the starting point for the citric acid cycle. The new six-carbon chain is partially broken down, releasing carbon dioxide. Several electrons are captured by electron carriers, and more carbon dioxide is released. The carbon dioxide that you exhale comes from the reactions of cellular respiration. Two ATPs are produced by the citric acid cycle for each molecule of glucose. At this point, only a small number of ATPs have been produced. However, more energy is available in the electrons that are being transported by electron carriers. While the citric acid cycle starts another round, let's follow an electron carrier to the next step in the process. Electron carriers such as NADH deliver their electrons to an electron transport chain embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. The chain consists of a series of electron carriers, most of which are proteins that exist in large complexes. Electrons are transferred from one electron carrier to the next in the electron transport chain. Let's take a closer look at the path electrons take through the chain. As electrons move along each step of the chain, they give up a bit of energy. The oxygen you breathe pulls electrons from the transport chain, and water is formed as a byproduct. The energy released by electrons is used to pump hydrogen ions, the blue balls, across the inner membrane of the mitochondrion, creating an area of high hydrogen ion concentration. Hydrogen ions flow back across the membrane through a turbine. Much like water through a dam, the flow of hydrogen ions spins the turbine, which activates the production of ATP. These spinning turbines in your cells produce most of the ATP that is generated from the food you eat. The process you've just observed 
cellular respiration, generates 10 million ATPs per second in just one cell. That ATP can power a biker up the trail, or it can power your brain cells as you learn challenging biology topics. At this point, we've taken glucose and we've broken it down through glycolysis into two pyruvates, and we made two ATPs profit as a result. That's great. Now, where do we go from here? Well, we have a few options. If we are a very large cell with very high energy needs, such as human cells, we might want to take those two pyruvates inside the mitochondrion and put it through cellular respiration. Now, cellular respiration requires oxygen. It is an, it is an aerobic process. But that's an option. If we are a prokaryotic cell, though, we might want to go this way. If our energy needs are fairly high, we might want to take that pyruvate into anaerobic respiration. That's beneficial because it harvests a lot of energy, but it doesn't require oxygen. It can occur in an anaerobic environment. There is a third option, though, and that's actually the way I want to go. I want to take our little pyruvates over here into fermentation. Fermentation is that partial breakdown of pyruvate. It's anaerobic, so it does not require oxygen. And it works really well in cells that have low energy needs. Let's talk about it a little bit more. Fermentation is a reaction that's mainly used by prokaryotic cells, although as we'll see, our cells can also use this reaction in extreme circumstances. Now, you've probably heard about fermentation in relation to cooking. We use it in the kitchen all the time to make products like beer and wine, um, cheeses and yogurts, sauerkraut and kimchi, even soy sauce is a fermented product. So in this, those cases, what we're doing is we're using little microorganisms, they perform this reaction for us, and they make all of those delicious, yummy products. It's important to note here that the fermentation reaction doesn't actually make ATP. If it doesn't make ATP, what's the point? Well, fermentation is usually found along with organisms that are also using glycolysis. Remember that glycolysis does produce a little ATP. And what fermentation does is it allows the cell to keep performing glycolysis so that that reaction can continue to make ATP for the cell. So that's why I said that fermentation is often found in cells with low energy needs. Remember that glycolysis only makes two ATPs at a time, so that's not a whole lot. Let's look at this in more detail. Here we have glycolysis and fermentation put together. This part is glycolysis. Remember, glycolysis changes glucose into pyruvate. It breaks it down. As a byproduct, it makes two ATPs, and it changes two NAD pluses into two NADHs. Now, in order for a cell to repeat glycolysis over and over and over again, it's going to need a lot of NAD+. It needs a constant supply of this energy molecule in the oxidized form in order to keep doing glycolysis and in order to keep making that little bit of ATP that it needs. So what fermentation actually does is it replenishes the NAD+. Let's take a look at it. Through fermentation, pyruvate, in this case, is going to be changed into lactate. So it gets transferred, and as part of this process, NADH is broken back down into NAD+. So that NAD+, that's released, can go back into glycolysis and be used again in glycolysis, and glycolysis can make more ATP, which is the product that the cell actually needs. The form of fermentation I just showed you is known as lactic acid fermentation. Remember that what happened was that pyruvate was converted into lactate, which is also known as lactic acid.
Now, prokaryotic cells can perform this reaction. In fact, microorganisms that we use to make cheeses and yogurts um, perform this type of fermentation. But it might surprise you to learn that our cells can also do lactic acid fermentation, but only in really extreme circumstances. Let's imagine what might happen if you go from sitting around at home to jumping up and running around the house. Inside your muscles, the oxygen is going to get used up pretty quickly. So the environment inside your muscle cells is going to become anaerobic. But the energy needs of your muscle cells is going to skyrocket. You need more ATP. So what that forces your cells to do is to depend more on glycolysis. Because glycolysis is anaerobic. Even though it can only make a little ATP at a time, it's better than nothing because you're pushing your body really hard. So your body will start to rely on glycolysis, and to keep that glycolysis going, it will need to rely on this fermentation as well. So fermentation ramps up too. Now the byproduct of this fermentation is lactic or lactic acid. There is some debate about what lactic acid actually does in terms of muscle soreness, but we know that muscle soreness occurs at the same time that lactic acid levels are high inside muscles. So there's some correlation between lactic acid and muscle soreness. Another form of fermentation that exists is known as alcoholic fermentation. In alcoholic fermentation, pyruvate is broken down and the products are ethanol, drinking alcohol or booze, and CO2. Alcoholic fermentation is used to make wines and beers, and in fact that's the fizzy part of wine and beer is the CO2 that's produced. We also use this to make bread. If you've ever made bread at home, you know you've got to put get your flour and stuff together, but you also have to add a yeast packet. Yeast is actually a microorganism. It's a living thing, and you activate it with a little bit of warm water, and then you put it in the bread, and then you let the bread rise. What's happening there? Well, what's happening is that the yeast have gotten very excited. They're going to start to eat the dough and ferment that dough, and they release a lot of CO2, and they release some ethanol as well. The CO2 is what makes the bread rise. It poofs up that bread. The ethanol gets baked out when you bake the bread. So there's no alcohol in baked bread anymore. And the baking process also kills the yeast. But that's alcoholic fermentation that's happening when you make bread. Congratulations, you are now finished with part one and two of this lecture. You should celebrate, maybe by going out and enjoying some of the excellent products of fermentation. And of course by that I mean, go enjoy a little soy sauce, some cheese, maybe some bread, and maybe not so much these other guys that could get you in trouble. Right, be careful out there. We'll see you guys in class.